Popping Tea Squad. It's your girl Keisha, and I'm here with tonight's All Tea All Shade Power Season 4, Episode 2 Review. Ooh, let's get into it. We start off this episode with Ghost. He's in jail, and he is about to lose his shit. He ain't got his hair cut, honey. That facial hair is grown out. And he is pissing blood because correctional officers beat his ass in last week's episode. Do I feel sorry for that nigga? Hell to the motherfucking off. We see Tasha and she's telling the kids that he's not coming home. And Tyreek say, that mean he did it? And she say, your dad would never kill anyone. Don't talk about this to anyone. We don't call that nigga Ghost. He is James St. Motherfucker Patrick. So Randy says, how did he get the name Ghost? And Tasha say, you know, we grew up in the hood. Everybody got a hood name shit. And the hood, your name would have been Ray Ray. <laughs> she assures them that everything will be fine. Keisha is banging on Tommy's motherfucking door. He's asleep because you know that nigga don't get up. It's like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. He comes to the door in his boxes and she say, what the fuck is going on, Tommy? You told me I would be safe. I was there when the feds raided Tasha's place. Angela's out for blood and Ghost ain't out of jail yet. I want yours and Tasha's name off of my shop. And he said it's too late for that. The feds are going to be going through their finances. Ghost name ain't on the shop. And if something pops off on Tasha's account, it's going to give the feds a fucking hard on. He just said, you, you don't get it. I got a kid to think about. You don't understand if you had one. And then Tommy, like, looks over his shoulder because little does she know he almost had a kid. And so he, you know, gets in his emotions. He goes and stands behind her and put his hands on her shoulder. And he tells her that he's going to be there for her no matter what. And I was like, just go ahead and fuck already. Proctor goes to see Ghost in jail looking like a whole snack. Looking like he got a lick. Blah. And I just want to sit on Proctor's face. Jared Ferreira can get it. That look motherfucker is fine. Charlie Murphy escorts Ghost in and gives him this look like you better not say shit, nigga. Or you gonna get a round two. Proctor sees that Ghost is hurt though. And so he says that you fight back. And Ghost says no, it was two against one. Proctor says good. No matter how much they fuck with you, you suppress Ghost. Proctor says his hands are tied until he finds out what the prosecutor's narrative is. Since they have Ghost's fingerprints and his DNA under Greg's nails. Ghost says you need to tell them about our relationship. And then we switch over to the Federal Bureau's office and they're discussing bringing Angela's relationship with Ghost up during the trial. Sack says who gives a fuck if she gets disbarred. James killed Greg in a jealous rage. Angela walks up and overhears everything and she's shocked. And John says no because all of you knew she was sleeping with him. If that comes out, all of you would get called up to testify by the defense, making your credibility zilch. Angela walks in like she didn't hear shit. And then we switch back to the jail. Proctor tells Ghost the same thing about not bringing her up during the trial. At this point, I'm just so tired of the writers figuring out ways to protect the Angela character. As a writer, you have to be biased with your characters. You can't show favoritism when writing. There has to be a cause and effect for emotions and for actions. And so far, throughout this whole entire show, the only thing that has happened to Angela's character is that Ghost broke up with her ass. And I'm just so sick of it. We are season four and this bitch has yet to feel anything. And by the end of this season, if this bitch ain't lost her job, I am done! John has Angela did she have a sexual relationship with Ghost? She says yes. And then Proctor and John both interrogate Angela and Ghost to show how it would go down on the stand and why they could not bring it up. They both say they can't be put on the stand. Proctor tells Ghost, we have to wait for the prosecution's next move. I'll work my magic on the outside and you make sure to make some phone calls while you're in here as Jane St. Patrick and let people know you'll be here for a while. It's all about perception. Crystal Ball fine ass. Like Crystal Ball can get it. Anyway, he wants it. Doggy style missionary. Spooning on my head, on a table, on the moon, on my back, whatever in my mouth, nigga. That fine motherfucker can get it. First of all, goes to talk to his associate. Uriel, I hope that's a Uriel, Uriel, or whatever, about Ghost being in jail and Tommy downplaying the situation like it won't affect business. Crystal Balls says, we push a shitload of product 
in my territory, I think your connect should know what I can do for his organization. So he's trying to dip, honey. Dre is at the club training Julio's girlfriend, some other white girl, and one of his homeboys. He tells them that when someone orders two bottles of whatever kind of drink, hit them with one bottle and a true matchbox. Julio's girlfriend say, what's in it? He tell her, you don't need to know all that, and don't tell Dominique what the fuck I'm doing. Two bottles go on the receipt, but only one bottle gets pulled from inventory. The other bottle just magically dis a motherfucking pierce. So his homeboy say, so everything looks legit in case we get audited. If you peep game, you see he weaseled his people into Ghost Club. I was like, this little mini motherfucker. I think that by the end of this season, Dre's character will be done and he will die this season. Dre gets a call, phone call from Ghost, and they pretend like everything is just Peachy King, like it's just a business call. He goes on to tell James that he has been running the club in his absence and that he talked to Karen and he got everything back on track with the expansion. And Ghost on the other end is like, oh, okay, little nigga, just because I'm in here, don't get over your head thinking you own my motherfucking club. I still got my dick on the table. Ghost is at lunch eating a dry ass KFC biscuit. <laughs> When some nigga that look like Tyrese roll up and say, I heard you run them clubs. You a rich boy. I'm still hungry. And that biscuit is looking mighty succulent. <laughs> Jail used the word succulent. Okay. So he scoop closer to the ghost. And he take a piece of ghost biscuit and eat it in here. Lick his thumb. I'm like, ugh, I know your thumb stink. And he said, you looking real pretty with them baby seal eyes. Really, writers? Baby seal eyes? I ain't never heard nobody use that analogy before in my life. So he rubbing Ghost's shoulder and then Ghost then breaks like his forearm. And the dude try to get up and attack Ghost. But Tony Terrero, whatever the fuck his name is, tell him to scram. He kind of look at Ghost like, I got my eye on you, little nigga. That scene was funny as fuck to me and not in a good way. It was just cringeworthy. The acting was just terrible with Lil Tyrese Jr. It was terrible. We see Dre at the club running like he little baby goes. We see the waitresses selling the pills and the matchboxes to all the customers. Then we see Proctor. He's doing an interview with the news defending Ghosts. John back at the Federal Bureau office is freaking out because Proctor is calling them racist. Angela says it's tarnishing their potential jury pool. Sandoval says we should try to get a gag order. John says we must because I'm not losing to this cocksuck again. This is more about winning against Proctor than about anything else. So Tasha drops the kids off at school. She tells them that they're going to see ghosts in jail. Tyreek say, what if I don't want to go? And she say, your father loves and misses you. We sit together. When we go, remember being recorded, we're being recorded, so don't call him ghost. And I just don't understand why she don't slap the shit off this little nigga at this point, because I'm just sick of him and his fuck ass mouth. Miranda gets out and Tasha tells Tyreek that she isn't going to tell ghosts about him drinking with these newfound friends of his. I'm like, see, there go the bad parent it again, but all right. She said, when your father was young, he had some pretty rough friends. One of them was named Kanan. Have you ever heard of him? And Tyreek say, no. So then Tasha sees a photographer outside taking pictures of them. She jump off the whip and she said, what the fuck are you doing? Leave my kids alone. What the fuck did I say? And the photographer fucking just keep on taking pictures of them. And she get mad. She snatches the shit out of his hand and she throws the cameras on the ground. He's like, I'm going to sue you. He's like, what the fuck is your problem? I'm going to sue you. And then Tyreek and his little fuck ass out the corner and say, is that how we're supposed to behave? Girl! At that point, you should have grabbed that little motherfucker by the back of his jacket and slapped the dog shit out of him in front of all them little good white folks. I'm so sick of this little character. I want that little nigga to die too this season. I'm tired of Tyreek. Kill that nigga already. Tyreek go into the building. Some little white kid roll up on him and say, that gun you brought to school, is that the same one your dad used? And Tyreek say, maybe. And then Raina say, are you dumb or are you stupid? Like, didn't you just hear what mama said? She said, don't say shit. And you say, she's a liar. Just like that. <laughs> hey, yo, nigga, this ain't 90210. So he then calls Kanan and tells Kanan that his dad ain't getting out of jail and that they uh that his mama want him to go visit him to jail. He, does that mean that he did it? I was like, oh, why are you telling all your family business? I'm just so sick of him. Oh, oh. So Kanan said, I told you I've known your dad for a long time. He's guilty as fuck. <laughs> but still go see him. 
So at this point, I was just not understanding why this little dumb motherfucker ain't piecing one and two together. So Tyreek say, why why he don't care about us? And Kanan say, because I got plans for us. You continue to be good. They'll trust you. Play the game, son. I'm just so over the storyline. It's just so fucking stupid. Like nobody in the history of life is this fucking dumb. I'm so over it. And it's gay as fuck. Just do what I say because I got plans for us. He gonna fuck you. <laughs> we see Tony visiting with his wife. And she says that this will be the last time she come visit him because she's just too sick. She says that she could do a new treatment. But the doc says that she got to pay up front. And Tony says the money didn't come through this time. And they talk about how she wishes she would have been able to give him some kids. So she would have somebody to take care of her. So he wouldn't have all of this weight of her sickness on his shoulders and he tells her you were the best thing that ever happened to me and that he promises that he'll get her the money julio goes to confront cristobal about not picking up his product and meeting with torero or toro whatever the fuck his name is cristobal says i'm not sure i can trust tommy cristobal friend domingo then jumps up and says, we work for you we might as well be walking around with targets on our backs so him and Domingo and then one of Julio people get into it and Domingo snuffs Julio's man but before they can even fight Julio jumps in and stops it and says to show how valuable you are I'm going to throw in a couple of extra bricks we good and Crystal Ball says yeah. I'm Proctor Angela and Sandoval are in the judges quarters and judge tells Proctor that they're asking for a gag order. Proctor's like, really, John? Like, really, bitch? And the judge tells John no, and to get into the game, because he will not be used in their ongoing pissing match. The FBI then goes to truth with a warrant. Sandoval is lurking around by himself with gloves on. And he goes into Ghost's office, and he's going through his drawers and everything, trying to find a good place to hide the gun. He plants the gun and uh, where like the ice trays and stuff will be uh, at the bar in Ghost's office. Dre and Donovan, the black agent, go into Ghost's office and Dre is confident they will not find anything and then of course Donovan finds the gun. Tasha and the kids, including missing ass Jasmine. Jasmine is back y'all and she like nine years old <laughs> and she like skin. Girl, I'm like, girl, Jess, where the fuck you been? You been at grandma's house, bitch, little red riding hood motherfucker. Like, what in the fuck? So Ghost tells Tyreek that he needs him to be the man of the house and he love him and he start crying and shit. I'm like, nigga, don't cry now. Save the motherfucking tears. You wasn't crying when you was over there fucking that Puerto Rican bitch about to leave everybody. You said fuck your kids, fuck your missing child, fuck your bitch, fuck your best friend. You said fuck everybody for the... And that little Puerto Rican hustle free throw pussy. Boy, bye. Tar asks Tommy why Ghost isn't out yet because he don't want to have to involve Chicago in this. Tommy's like, we got this. He's going to be out of jail soon. Tommy sees Marcus' face, the dude that Domingo punched in the face. And Marcus like, you know, Cristobal, homie Domingo was running his mouth and got one off. And Tommy's saying, Julio didn't stop this. Like, I told that nigga he was going to go talk to him on my behalf and handle that shit accordingly. Tommy goes to Keisha's apartment to calm himself down. And my pussy was on fire. Tommy looked great in that scene. Outfit on point, haircut on point, body on point. I wanted to sit on that good white dick and ride it to oblivion. Yes, God. Come on, Tommy. Come on, Joseph Sakura, the actor. So Keisha answered the door in a cute little old fashioned Nova dress. <laughs> She got all her little flip flops. I'm like, bitch, you might be sexy just be walking around the house. And he tells her that he came to check on her. And she like, mm -hmm, really? You ain't come over and get this good old New York la la Anthony pussy? He asked, she asked him, is he hungry? And she, he said, nah, I'm good. And he took off his jacket. And I was like, shh, what the fuck? Now or later? Yes! He tells her that he needs her help with the shop. She's like, okay, as long as it's safe, because I'm about to give you this pussy, nigga. <laughs> Tommy said, where cash at? He at home. And she say, he at his cousin house. We all here by ourselves. AKA, I can get as loud as I want to. <laughs> I mean, lean over. And he kiss on her mouth. And I was thinking and pretending like it was me instead of la la. And then he start fingering her little pussy and shit. And I was like, 
finger fuck the fuck out that little TRL pussy nigga. Pull his little pants down. We see that little white booty of his. And then he lifts her ass up on that little ghetto ass granite countertop. And he get the back and hook back out. But he was doing that white boy speed fuck. And I was like, slow down, nigga. Slow down. Slow it down. This pussy ain't going no motherfucking word, nigga. And she like, ooh, Tommy. Ooh, shit. I wasn't expecting this type of dick. <laughs> and all I can think of the whole scene is why is she fucking him with the flip flops on? <laughs> Made it look so ghetto, and I swear I saw a roach. Tony then meets with his lawyer and he asks for info on ghosts. His lawyer tells them that he's a nightclub owner and that his business partner is Thomas Egan. And Tony's face goes pale because at this moment, you put two and two together, he's Tommy's father. Boom! Tony says, Where did St. Patrick grow up? and his Lawyer says he and Egan are both from Queens. He wasn't really worried about his wife not having no kids for him because he already had a son out there. Tommy pulls up his pants after fucking Lakeisha and she's, he asks her, have you ever played in the snow before? <laughs> and I was like, because he was talking to me, fuck up. I was like, no, <laughs> the snow can be unpredictable. You don't know how many inches you're going to get. <laughs> and he say, well, you got a goddamn blizzard your first time. And I was like, did not, nigga, did not. <laughs> so I told him, you can't tell Tasha we smashed. Because whatever I have, something nice, she tried to take it from me. Just like Sean. And Tommy said, Tasha was fucking Sean. Did Ghost know? And I told him, yeah, he knew. But he was so caught up with Angela, he ain't care. It was just Tasha's way of getting back at Ghost. But she took Sean away from me just like she's doing with my business. You're like the only good thing that has come out of this whole situation for me, Tommy. And then he look at her like, damn, like this bitch really catching feelings with me, my white dick. So he says, your business is safe. I promise you that. And you're right. T can't know about us. And at this point, I'm realizing he like her. But she like him more, and Lakeisha's way over her head with this whole situation. I don't know if she's going to survive this, y'all. Ron presents his side of the case to the grand jury, and we see the camera pan to this black bailiff. And Proctor is outside the court office pacing, and he gets a text from that same black bailiff telling him everything that happened on the inside. He paid him off. John congratulates Donovan for finding the murder weapon in Ghost's office. They're still trying to pin Tommy as Ghost so they can connect him with the Lobos murder. Angela says he has his mom, Kate, as an alibi for the night Lobos was murdered. She suggests that they get a warrant for a tail and catch him in the act of distributing drugs. Bitch. Tommy then meets with Proctor and Proctor says that you bring the re-up for my wife. He's steady getting drugs for his wife. Tommy says, I talked to Dre. He told me they found a gun at Truth. Proctor says, I believe him when he says that he didn't do it, but the jury won't. They're saying he did it because you asked him to because you're partners. Tommy says, so if he goes down, I go down. Proctor says, yeah, if they can prove you're a drug dealer, it'll help their case. You need to lay low. Tommy says, I'm under pressure to keep doing what I'm doing. Tommy then gives Proctor the drugs, but pulls him in and says, if things go sideways and I get arrested, I'm going to kill you. Mingo is walking to his car, and we see the camera pan over this Dodge. And he sparks up a blunt. He gets in the car, and he's blowing the smoke out the window. He got his eyes closed, and he opened his eyes, and guess who's standing there? Tommy with a gun pointing at his head. Tommy tells him to get out the car. He gets out the car, and then this is when shit went left for me as a writer. Tommy says, run. I'll even give you a head start. Domingo stands there. He said, did I stutter? Run, motherfucker. Domingo starts running. Tommy standing there. is like, one, two, ten. Gets in the car. He then starts following Domingo as he's running down the street in this car that we see vivid as day. And he then, after taunting him for a minute, runs Domingo over with the car. Domingo's on the ground, 
bloody, bruised, and battered. He then runs the car backwards over him, breaks his leg, and then Domingo's like, get the car off me, get the car off me. He's like, you know, basically don't ever disrespect none of my people again. And then he speeds off in the car. Now, if you don't know anything about television and as a writer, two things that w went left for me in this scene. First of all, this scene was a blatant ripoff of Game of Thrones Episode 9, Battle of the Bastards. When Ramsey Bolton was about to kill one of the Stark brothers and he had him run across the field, was taunting him with the bow and arrow, making it seem like he was about to kill him at first and made him suffer not knowing when it was going to happen and then he finally shoots him with the bow and arrow. That was a complete bite off of Game of Thrones. Second of all, they had to write this scene for a product placement for Dodge. <laughs> scene was just a product placement. Let me key you in. Anytime you're watching a television show or a reality show and they pan in on a Pacific product, that's product placement. That means that that company paid them to place their product in their show. So that was the reason why we saw the outside of the car. We saw how it looked on the inside. We saw how it even drove down the street. So Tyreek is waiting for Kanan at his apartment and Kanan shows him how to break into an apartment with just a credit card. Tyreek asks, has he ever heard of a man named Kanan? He says, yeah, but Kanan is dead. I'm so tired of this writing. Proctor tells Ghost what's going on with, with the case. He tells him they're trying to make this whole thing a RICO so they can prosecute both of you under the Kingpin stat statute, meaning him and Tommy. He said, you both be charged as drug traffickers, and I can't win that case. It's a mandatory life sentence. Ghost says, so they're going to offer me a deal to snitch on Tommy. Proctor says, if I were you, I would strongly consider flipping. He said, but you ain't me. This is about Tommy and I. Tommy then goes to his place. And as he gets out of the car and goes to the building, we see an FBI agent place a tracker under, underneath his car. He invited his mama over. She in the panic. They talking. He tells her that he got rid of Holly. And he then gives her the keys to his truck, which was genius because he was about to go do some shit involving drugs. So his mama take the car. And then he jumps in the car with one of his workers. So Angela talks to Sandoval and she says to him that the gun at Truth is bothering me. I think that he left it there to beat his case. Sandoval says you're overthinking it. Then we see John come in and he says that they're approved for the death penalty. Angela is shocked by this and at this point she realized that she might have gone too far and fucked up. Proctor then goes to the jail to tell Ghost the news. Ghost is sick to his stomach. Y'all gonna get another fucking knees, old, light-skinned, white, Latino bitch ass. <laughs> Shout out to Puerto Rico. We see Tasha getting a phone call about the news that he's gonna be facing death penalty, and she is, like, in tears. Then we see Charlie Murphy walking goes back to his cell, and he's telling him all about how it feels for an inmate to die underneath the death penalty, and how it's a slow, painful process, and that he's gonna face this. And then we see Tasha goes to Angela's apartment. Angela answered the door. Tasha said, you had my kids her and you gonna let their father die for something he didn't do? Angela says, I don't know if Proctor told you about this, but Jamie's fingerprints were found. His DNA were under Greg's nails and they found the murder weapon at Truth. Tasha said, ain't no fucking way he left the gun around at Truth. Okay? And like I said before, he would never kill an FBI agent. He never mentioned Greg Knox to me, not once. Angela said, the night I came to the club when I saw Jamie again, I had a boyfriend then and it was Greg. So Tasha standing there like, did this motherfucker kill this nigga over this bitch? And so she is pissed at this point. And she said, I swear to God, if you weren't a goddamn cop. And Angela says, but I am. Good night, Tasha. <sighs> Just so sick of her always being one up over Tasha. Such favoritism with right. I just can't. That is just burns my fucking blood. So Dre is at truth when Kanan runs up on him and says, why the fuck you talking to Tyreek? He asks about Kanan. Tyreek said, I ain't say nothing. Kanan chokes the shit out of him. Dre said, I'm paying you to stay away from Tyreek. And he said, you were. You done told so many lies and made so many enemies. You ain't got no friends. Now you paying me to keep you alive. Once again, Dre gonna die this season. 
So then Ghost calls Tommy from jail and they both miss the fuck out of each other and they having a really endearing conversation and it's just it was painful almost to watch. And Ghost says, help me. And Tommy said, what do you need for me to do? He said, I need you to take care of my family. And Tommy says, I got you. I'm going to take care of everything. And they get off the phone. <sighs> so I give tonight's episode a C plus. It wasn't the best episode. It was very slow. I know all the actors and even Courtney Kim said that every episode is going to be better than the next. This wasn't a very good episode to me. It was just setting the stage for what's going to happen. Like I said, I'm just tired of the favoritism when it comes to certain characters on this show. It's just so unrealistic for me as a writer. Angela will not die this season. I went on IMBD and she and Omari Hardwick are both slated for season five. They're the only two people that have already been slated to come back for season five. No one else has been uh, contracted yet. So her character will not die. Once again, no retribution for the things that she has done. If, like I said, if they do not make this girl suffer this season and she loses everything going into season five, like Ghost lost everything in season three going into season four, I'm done. Like, I'm just done. Like, I'm just over it. I'm just so over it. I think that Lorenz Tate's character, Lorenz Tate will be playing a Jamaica Queen city councilman. I believe that he will be Tasha's new love interest, and I am here for that shit. Tasha, get your back crack, bitch. Leave that nigga alone. Fuck ghosts. Let me know what you all think about tonight's episode down below in the comment section. What was, what was your favorite and worst part? Make sure to thumbs up and like this video and subscribe to my channel so when season 5 comes, God willing, I'm still on this earth, you all will know when my power reviews drop. I know a lot of you go and then come back when power comes and I see a lot of you saying in the comment section, I couldn't find your channel. I'm so happy I finally did. Subscribe to my channel so you won't have to go through that drama. So that's it for this video. I love you guys so much. Thank you for watching and I will see you all next week. Love you. Bye, kittens. All her life, Messiah's faced nothing but hardship, trials, and tribulations. She's tried to work, pray, sex, sleep, and smoke her problems away, but she can't escape the gloomy gray clouds hovering over her head. Just wanting to be happy, she's blinded by love. Messiah only sees what she wants to see, always building up to be let down and ultimately crashing. She craves love and admiration, but doesn't love herself enough to know when it's time to let go of an old flame. Direct she list, she coasts along through life numb until she meets Shaheen, the man who will change her life forever. He's everything she never knew she wanted, but everything that she absolutely needed. Without permission, Shaheen marches into her life and turns everything upside down. He's rude, cocky, angry, and devastatingly handsome. To the world, he's nothing but an ex-convict with a chip on his shoulder. But to Messiah, he's an angel sent down from heaven who teaches her how to love again. When Messiah finds herself wasting time daydreaming about when she'll see or speak to him again, she knows she's in trouble. Love wasn't in the equation for her, especially since she still has feelings for her ex. And Shaheem has a ghetto baby mother and two kids. Will their love prevail or will self-doubt, self-pity, and a sense of emptiness stop everything before it starts? Cranes in the Sky is available at Amazon.com on Kindle and in paperback. The links are down below in the description box. Love you guys and thank you.